everyone, and welcome to um, our breakout for the project How Should Decisions About Heritage Be Made? Uh, thanks especially for coming and sitting in the circle. As you've probably noticed, and I think just say hello to our viewers at home and uh, on their mobile phones and devices around the country, we are being live streamed. So just to say that anything we say will be on the internet somewhere <laughs> and in many places. So just to, to say that at the beginning. Um, <laughs> So my name's Helen Graham, I'm a um, uh, research fellow in heritage at the University of Leeds and I'm going to be running this workshop with... Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Danny Callahan, and I'm one of the uh, project partners um, on this conversation really, which is what the project's been about. So it's really nice to have a, another micro inquiry if you like, so it's a, a further conversation from my point of view. Thanks, Danny. So what we, what we want to do in, our, in the hour we've got together, really, is um, hear about all of you, like what you're working on, the kind of decisions and decision-making in relationship to heritage you're involved in, and um, very much because that's the core of what our project is, but also because the multiple perspectives on the questions of the politics of heritage and decision-making has been at the core of the way in which the project's operated. So we wanted to bring a bit of that ethos to what we're doing today. Then we want to share a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, and share that with you and sort of uh, just to kick open some discussions between us um, and then obviously we'd love to keep in touch with you we're, we're just uh, coming to we're midway through our sort of analysis phase aren't we Danny and so we, we've got ideas we're, they're starting to coalesce but it's a really great time for us to share them so we'd love to keep in touch and we've got a booklet um, that Danny I think has been passing around um, that sort of shares where we're up to really and so we, that, that again is a kind of opening of a conversation and we've also got a stall downstairs and we're going to end up the day by uh, asking you to contribute things on our, our beautiful mini plaques to commemorate uh, things that you've thought during the workshop will then go into our, our stall downstairs D15 to come and see us so um, that's what we're going to do uh, so just wanted to kick off by doing some introductions um, so who's here? It'd be great to know who's here, what different perspectives are in the room, what, what work can we do today because all of you are here I suppose is the question. So pass it around, sort of say who you are, whether you're involved in a project and maybe share something, either a decision about heritage you've been involved in or one that you're interested in, uh, just to give us a flavour of, of kind of what brought you here today. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to pass the microphone around. So great, okay. Like a over to you. Um, hi, I'm Toby Pillett and I'm an early career researcher but I work at, I, um, I do and have done a lot of work on community heritage projects, particularly projects funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and currently I'm an archaeological consultant um, for an area of woodland in Sheffield which has a lot of archaeology in it um, and I'm, there's potential for building more projects based on what we've already done there so I'm just thinking about potential things we could do basically and 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 how and different ways of making heritage relevant to different people. Hi, I'm Matt Chilcott. I work for a community interest company, CMC Squared, who are based in Monmouthshire. Uh, I'm also a PhD researcher working with the Communities 2.0 programme in Wales, which is a digital inclusion intervention programme. Uh, my area of interest and activity is looking at working effectively with communities to enable greater digital engagement, I guess is a, uh, an active word, using heritage as a driver. Um, one of the projects that we've had success uh, with recently has been Monmouthpedia, where we collaborated with the Wikipedia community, uh, developing the world's first Wikipedia town in Monmouth. And that's led to a number of sort of legacy projects uh, across South Wales, which are much more sort of community focused, just looking at a range of digital technologies, creating new sense of place with communities and really seizing on communities' passion for their locality and sharing their local knowledge. So that's, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name's Jack Elmont. I'm the chairman of the board for a theatre and arts company, Theatre Nemo in Glasgow. And last year we were working on the history of Berlini and we got some funding from Aberdeen University to do some of the, the history research. We worked in communities and in Berlini prison and the guys 
put on a show and created a collage of Berlini. Our interest, what we found was, what we were really looking at was the social impact of imprisonment and how that legacy can follow you through when you get out of prison and what does it actually mean. So we are currently looking at developing a holistic centre for people coming out of prison to try and change the social and economic future for people so as their background, their legacy changes as they're moving forward. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is James White. I'm a lecturer in urban design at the University of Glasgow. Um, I don't have much connection to heritage um, as such, but I'm very interested in how uh, professional design experts and the general public interact on the on the topic of design and community and neighbourhood planning, in particular around different aesthetic preferences perhaps that professional architects have and, and members of the community have perhaps and members of the community having more of a preference for a traditional aesthetic. Um, and, I, and I look at that um, through large scale post-industrial waterfront projects and I'm also doing a bit of work on community gardening and its impact on sort of fostering community on the south side of Glasgow. So that's, I'm here to listen and learn from everyone else about heritage. Uh, hi, my name's Paul Duffy. Uh, I think I'm part of a Scottish uh, corner that seems to be developing here accidentally. <laughs> uh, I, work on <laughs> I work on the Isle of Bute in Scotland. I run Brandani Archaeology and Heritage, which is a consultancy community engagement business. I would probably describe myself as many things, but an embedded archaeologist is probably one of them, in that I live in the community that I work in and work with neighbours, friends, people on that island in terms of developing the heritage of the island. Uh, I moved there five years ago for a heritage lottery funded landscape partnership scheme which was all about helping people to engage with landscape and archaeology and heritage and one of those things that people wanted to engage with and we wanted to entertain people, educate people, upskill people and give people the confidence to develop their own interests in archaeology and heritage in the island uh, and that's something that I've continued to do since the project finished in 2012 through a variety of projects. The one I'm here for today is the Para Archive project with Leeds University where we're looking at helping people to tell digital stories and stories about farming heritage um, which is one of the key things that come up in our research framework, our community research framework that people were interested in developing and understanding stories of so so that's it thank you uh, hello my name is uh, joe verhunst uh, and i'm a anthropologist at aberdeen university um uh, also in scotland so <laughs> let's continue that theme um and uh, i suppose there's two things in the uh, first one i've been involved in is a, a landscape history and archaeology project uh, near to aberdeen um, and my interests in that are thinking about how landscape history and archaeology and so on can actually help us um, affect um, and influence land use and land management and land ownership uh, in the present and the future, um, in, in the highlands of Scotland in particular. Um, and I'm also um, uh, involved in a, a, a Connected Communities Legacy project uh, with Helen and, and others um, where we're interested in learning from um, connected communities, heritage research in particular. Hello, I'm Jane Wells. I shall carry on the farming connection, <laughs> the farming theme. I'm sort of here in two capacities really. One is I work for an organisation called Junction Arts in Derbyshire and I'm just coming to the end of a two and a half year project called Combine which has involved groups of young people acting as researchers to research the farming heritage of their county. So working across Leicestershire, Derbyshire, Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire, Northamptonshire and Rutland. And that's been a fascinating project involving the young people working with farmers, a record office, museums, local people gathering oral histories and we've got a huge um, archive of material now and so it'd be interesting to think about what we should do with that, how we can share that or lodge it with a record office or have it available for people to to access. But I'm also here with um, the Para Archive project and I'm one of the community researchers 
on the Ceramic City Stories project. I'm researching two years of my mother's life when she worked in a pottery factory. So. Um, hello, uh, I'm Chiara Bonacchi and I'm an early career researcher. Um, at the moment I'm working on a project that uses crowdsourcing um, to co-produce archaeological data and then use them uh, to develop um, new research agendas together with online uh, communities. Uh, and uh, my interests more widely are um, in how digital technologies and digital platforms can be used uh, to um, research the human past collaboratively, uh, but also how digital methods can be used to really understand the value um, of this work uh, and study it. I not expecting this. Colin Shepherd, archaeologist, uh, work alongside Joe, so it'll be repetitious rather a lot of what he said. Working on Benaki Landscapes project, um, looking at using the landscape to help educate youngsters in various school projects and use it as a means of maybe engendering a community spirit amongst flagging communities, uh, giving them uh, a better sense of their past identity and what could be their future identity. Also involved with Helen and Joe with the Heritage Legacies thing, looking at how decisions on heritage issues are arrived at. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ollie Jensen from the University of Brighton. Uh, I'm a media studies scholar. Um, I I work on the aesthetics and form of protest and activism as it goes uh, digital, uh, as it moves from the analog and performed uh, into predominantly the digital sphere. So I also look a lot at social media aspects as well, um, digital en engagement. Uh, I, I, I look particularly at LGBTQ activism uh, and that's an area where uh, the community has traditionally struggled with intergenerational legacies. They are not encouraged or has not been encouraged. So uh, bringing archive material to younger generations who live online um, is a way of, of again, driving um, engagement, hopefully. Um, other aspects of my work that kind of relate to um, the heritage theme uh, is that I've also worked on medical history archives, um, research done from a culture studies or trauma theory point of view, um, so the, the archive aspect. Hi, I'm Lavinia Bryden, I'm from the University of Kent, I'm an early career researcher and I'm a lecturer in film. Um, my research interests really lie in landscapes, especially gardens and parks on the screen. And this is British cinema that I deal with. So where the, the research interests are now developing are in the how these locations exist beyond the film text, how um, they might inspire film tourism and how then the, the sort of film tourist um, interacts with then the local community and how that location therefore has different stories for different people. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Paul Furness, and um, I'm interested in Northern cultural history and Yorkshire identity. And I um, conduct occasional walks around, alternative walks around York about concentrating on the history that the city establishment doesn't want us to know about, really. Hi, Veronica Dewey, doing Duet Australia on um, Doing Butte and Nogget Fly. Um, again, he did your dev on Yaithoid. So, um, Veronica um, from Australia, but I'm here studying um, minority languages and especially looking at Welsh and Gurnai, which is an Aboriginal language or my language. Hi, I'm Rebecca Clifford. I'm a senior lecturer in history at Swansea University. Actually, strangely, I've never thought of my work as particularly being about heritage, um, but I've worked for years on commemoration, uh, especially uh, relating to World War II, and so I can see some clear overlaps. And at Swansea, we are also about to launch a heritage MA. So in that sense, I've got a kind of new interest in heritage. 
Um, Kerry Faser, Connected Communities Leadership Fellow, generally interested in all of this. <laughs> I'm Mike Gulliver from the University of Bristol. Um, I'm an early careers researcher. Um, my research has predominantly been about the history of the deaf community, so signing deaf people. Um, and the tensions that come from a group described generally as a disability group, but who see themselves as a linguistic minority. Um, so I have worked, for example, on the way that the deaf community have mobilized and politicized their heritage to generate a politics of activism um, in remembering banquets and events and causes and marches and that kind of stuff and, and shaping those in the record. Um, to generate a particular politics. Uh, at the moment, I'm working on a project looking at the first church that was built specifically for deaf worship on Oxford Street in London, um, which was there for 50 years from 1870-ish to 1920-ish. Um, and so we're interested... There are two aims, really, I guess, linked to the heritage. We're interested to... Um, critically address the kind of good versus evil histories that tend to come out. Um, the church is often portrayed as evil and the deaf community is good, so we're trying to critically pick that apart. Um, but we're also interested, we've been unearthing heritage, tons and tons of historical material, and there doesn't seem to be any way to get that to the deaf community so they can use it. So um, looking for containers and ways to manage that in the future. Uh, hello again. I'm going to be very brief because I'll probably talk a little bit about some of some of my background. But I'm an artist. I'm a facilitator um, on public history projects. Um, I'm increasingly a digital archivist and uh, working increasingly with social media in relation to a, a lot of those activities. A lot. M most of my work is about decision making processes. Always has been. Um, it's about how you get a, a, a wider group of people involved in decision making processes. Um, I'm involved in a co-design project with, with Helen and the team, uh, which has been uh, incredibly uh, inspirational, quite honestly, at times. And I'm also involved in the Power Archive project, uh, which is a digital storytelling project, um, which is all, both led by University of Leeds and the, some really intriguing um, links between some of that work. Uh, I'll pass it to, to me. Hi, I'm Alison Hess. I'm the Curator of Research and Public History at the Science Museum, um, which is my obvious link to heritage. Um, my role there is I support research in the broadest definition into our collections and our practices. Um, I'm really interested in sort of the heritage, I guess, our collections that are stored heritage um, and how you access that. Um, and I'm here with the Power Archive Project as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm Laura Bones, I'm a Programmes Coordinator at the AHRC in the Creative Arts and Digital Histories team. Hi, uh, my name is Matthew Carr and I also work for the AHRC as the um, Peer Review College Coordinator for membership. Are you taking part? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben, I actually recently completed my PhD, which was AHRC funded, which was about how um, production technologies were used in old, um, well, television drama in the UK, and how technology, as technology evolved, it changed how the, the ideological makeup and, and the aesthetic practice of making television shows. Um, so yeah, that's me, really. Great, thank you. Do you have to stay near the door for, as part of your duties, or do you want to... Come, come closer. Because we're going to be doing. So, just thank you all so much for introducing yourself. Because what we're hoping to do is use all of your experiences, the things you're working on, the things you are, you know, bringing to these debates about the politics of heritage, as part of this workshop. And there's going to be a section a little bit after we've introduced what we've been doing in the project, where we're going to open that up and try and get into some of the, I guess, the political dimensions of all the work that you've just introduced your interest in. So, between me, Paul. Paul and Danny, we're going to just introduce a little bit about what we've been working on, um, just to give you a flavour, really. Um, so I'm going to got got some pictures. Um, so the How Should Decision About Heritage Be Made project has been one of the Connected Communities Co-Design, Co-Creation Development Awards, which means that um, the AHRC have funded us to work together 
between February and May last year to design the research project that we've been carrying out now um, since June last year. So we actually were funded to work together to design a research project. And there were 14 of us involved, all from quite different backgrounds and perspectives and types of organisations. And that was really at the core of the ethos of the project, that by bringing people who were quite differently situated, some people very senior roles within funding organisations, some people working very much with planning um, from a conservation officer perspective in a local authority context, people have set their own village archives, activists of, about uh, sort of radical history within cities, civic trusts, people who run uh, all our stories, heritage lottery funded projects, whole mixture and using those different perspectives as a kind of conceptual engine for designing our research. So um, just to introduce some of the kind of key ideas, we had a, had a couple of workshops, didn't we, Danny, between February and May last year, um, where we were trying to sort of generate what the main issues around decision making in the sense of politics of heritage. And so these were just some of the kind of initial ideas we came up about, came up with, but very much focusing around who gets to define what counts as heritage, what counts as significant, who's it for, what's the role of the professional, the role of the institution was something that kept coming up repeatedly in our sort of thinking. And the role of the individual. Yes, and the role of the individual. Um, and one of the things we kind of became quite interested in, the word mess came up repeatedly in our workshops, as in, this is all messy, what are we doing? As well as um, maybe there's something about mess going on in relationship to the way heritage politics works. And so we started to think about using sort of systemic thinking approaches to understand some of the ways in which heritage decision making works within ecologies of cities, but also ecologies of organisations as well. So these were some of the questions that we, we came up with and we've been working with. Um, Last October, we got together with 15 other people. We did an open call just to see who else might be interested within, within our sort of various networks that we use, publicly advertised, just to see if we could get some peop other people's brains on the ideas we came up with and try to sort of see, um, test some of our ideas, test our research plan, just to see and we see whether it resonated really. And, there, and then having tested it, adapt what we were going to do. So we asked um, someone from Scriberia, which is an illustration company based in London, to come and illustrate our conversations. And it's actually proved quite helpful, hasn't it? Because kind of, it kind of crystallised and visualised some of the things that have been floating around in a slightly more abstract way in our heads. But one of the key ideas, I suppose, is that throughout this picture is this stream, which is kind of like heritage. Heritage is a sort of stream of life in the way that we were conceptualising it. But one of the things that kept coming up was the idea that getting in the way of a more democratic and a more open approach to heritage decision making was certain kinds of blocks and sticking points, both conceptually and sometimes physically. And um, so this is kind of illustrated here. But two of the ones we wanted to just foreground today in, in this workshop were the sort of sticking points of everyone and forever. So I know the, whether you know the National Trust tagline is forever for everyone. And they sound like good things, don't they? They sound, yeah, sound, sounds all right, doesn't it? Everyone sounds like a good idea, sounds quite inclusive. Um, but one of the things that we, more and more we thought about the way in which everyone works as a kind of imaginary, political imaginary, is that it, it kind of puts a lot of power in the hands of professionals and um, ask them, expects them almost, this idea of everyone, ask them to play that role of mediator between people. And actually means in some senses, it's like, no, you can't really be that involved because we've got to think about everyone else. So it kind of became kind of conceptually a bit of a sticking point in the way in which heritage and museums operate. So we started to sort of really try and think that through. It's kind of a little bit like holding passionate people at arm's length in the name of sort of public duty or public service. So we've been trying to think about that. Alan, can I just add? Yeah. There's, there's actually quite a lot of, there's a lot of activity, lots of official and formal activity, and there's a, an awful lot of unofficial and, and under the radar activity going on, you know, in spite of institutions and because of, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that just, it just became a, a, a useful analogy to say there's, there's backwaters and eddies and currents and blocks and different um, things that, that are contributing to what seems to be um, a movement is too is 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 maybe too too specific, but certainly the the you know I think we all represent um, different actions and activities, and we know for many decades there's been culture change happening, 
at an individual level and, and within some libertarian organizations was one of the words we said, but you know, within some institutions and certainly within the individuals. So it was just, that was the, that was, that was sort of how, how we started to, to, to focus on this idea of blocks, um, diversions, and those were the processes maybe around heritage decision making, both formal and informal. Yeah, and part of the thing is that the blocks aren't always, the blocks are often about valuing something, about saying it's important and significant, but then it also has consequences, which is why I've been looking at them and trying to focus within that as a way of, of um, developing our research. And so the other, the other kind of sort of block we noticed was this idea of, um, of stewardship or the idea of the future in perpetuity. Again, that sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Keeping things forever or trying to keep things that are important forever. But one of the effects of that is that it often means that its use in the present becomes less tangible, less dynamic, less kind of available for use for people now. And I suppose we recognise that as both something that heritage is kind of intrinsic to the idea of heritage, but it's also something we want to do some thinking with and try to reimagine in some way. So um, one of the things, um, mess had been a theme by now for quite a few months, and one of the feedback we got from this kind of this drawing when we showed it around is that it's very messy, it's very confusing and very cluttered. And I think that was really helpful for us to kind of conceptualise that as well, that one of the things we wanted to try and do with our research was to declutter a little bit, to try and... Um, so one of the things that Mike Benson would say is declutter and re-engineer, and that's the kind of language that he was bringing to it. But the idea was to try and... Uh, recognize something that's quite simple going on which is about people being able to share and talk about with other people things that are important to them and almost try and take it back to that sense of what heritage is as kind of culture as life um, and so that was behind that so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about our research so we designed three inquiry strands and I'm going to pass over to Danny to talk about the first one um. Yeah, make, making a familiar strange. I never quite understood that title, if I'm honest. But uh, yeah, um, I think it's it, it's fair to say when we you, you saw that um, there's there's a lot of different perspectives, there's a lot of different interests in the group, and it's it's sort of replicated even in the introductions today. People are coming from fundamentally different perspectives and and have different drivers and interests. So it, to try and cram that into one, although it's slightly contradicting Helen's thing about decluttering, but it's sort of it, in a way we all we 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 decided we needed at least three strands, and then within the strands we had micro strands as well. So um, this was just an example. I was responsible for the um, came in with with a project called the Pottery's Tile Trail, which is a um, community, it's an All Our Stories, Her Heritage Lottery Fund, All Our Stories funded project, which is about, uh, it's a community research and crowdsourced vir uh, virtual collection of tiles and architectural ceramics um, to be found in Stoke-on-Trent, which made lots of those tiles and ceramics that you'll find in Cardiff and every other sh Empire shipping line, you know, out of, out of Stoke. Uh, so it was, this, it's, um, it was 300, it's a 300 item collection on History Pin, which is one of the online platforms some of you will know. Um, and it's geolocated photographs and commentary um, about, about those, those specific items. So it's, it's very been a very interesting hyper local discussion with individuals and communities across the, the six towns that make up the Federated City of Stoke. But it's also been a, an interesting discussion, wider discussion with, with formal, um, the formal players in the city like the conservation team about this historical ceramic public art collection across the city that's under people's nose is literally under their feet on their own doorsteps they own it it's in pubs it's in churches etc etc so there was a whole thing about reviewing and and um, revaluing so that was just I, I guess that was the, the, the strand that, that I that I particularly um, uh, was involved in 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 sort of exploring in a little bit more detail from a, reflect, a reflective point of view. Um, one of the partners in the, in the project team was Karen Brookfield, who's a, um, a strategic director for Heritage Lottery Fund, who had overall responsibility for the All Our Stories program strand. So it was wonderful. She was incredibly committed to working in partnership with me. We had, um, between us, we had three full, full days in Stoke-on-Trent. She came out from uh, from London and to, to have a look. So this micro and macro perspective on a, on a project and, and she met quite a few of the activists and um, the people uh, who, who'd 
being connected with the project and, and um, you know, continue to, to um, try and get their activities sort of recognised and, and off the ground. So there was a really interesting discussion there about strategic policy and um, the realities of, of getting work, grassroots-led work off the ground and brokers like me and maybe people like Paul who are working away, you know, somewhere within it. So there was a very interesting conversation with, with Karen about the role of HLF. So that, was, that gave us a chance to, to reflect, scrutinize the project from, um, if it makes sense, I was working in the project as a facilitator um, for, for best parts of, tw of 12 months and, and working with Karen and, and on behalf of the, the Heritage Decisions Project gave me a chance to look at it from without, if, if that makes sense, to, to, to really, in quite a rigorous way, to, to unpack what the thing was about and, um, again, get a, a much broader conversation with the, the constituency, the project constituency, around what mattered to them. Great, thanks, Wayne. And we'll talk more about what's coming, coming out of that just after we've introduced what we did. Um, the second thing we did um, with Tim Boone from the Science Museum, who Alison works really closely with, was look at um, experimenting. So the three strands were broadly orientated around um, looking at things from the inside or making the familiar strange, which resonated with some people and not others, or um, experimenting. So strand two is all about experimentation. So we're working with Tim Boone, who's head of public history and research at the Science Museum, and groups of people who were fans, artists, musicians in relationship to electronic music. We were exploring how to collaboratively collect electronic music and how the Science Museum should do that. And so we ran in a sense two parallel inquiries. The one was a quite pragmatic thing, like what should be collected, but using that as a mechanism for asking these questions about the museum and sort of democratic decision making and how it operates. Um, and that's been a really fantastic strand. We've, um, we, did, uh, we did some things at the Science Museum late, the synthesizer bingo, where we kind of uh, tried to engage more people in debates we've been having, both about the synths, but also about the more meta questions about how decisions about collecting are made and who, who should be involved and those kinds of questions. So that was strand two. And finally, strand three, which is based in York, and I'll just pass over to Paul to, to introduce it, but came out of discussions between Martin Bashforth and... And we're doing live streaming, Paul. Sorry, sorry. We're on the, I didn't we're on the internet. No. Um, right. Um, in New York, if, you, if, if people have been there, it's, it's a city that um, perhaps more than anything um, bases a lot of its economy on heritage, and heritage can get a bit pricey in New York. So what we, what we've been doing is uh, several different things. To I mean, I mean Yorkshire cities can be quite boisterous, and we've tried to bring that uh, that boisterousness. Um, Back in back into the discussion about things because the the people who like, representatives of the council in York or the um, civic trusts or some of the heritage organisations, um, I've got a very specific idea about what um, what York is and how it's sold, and that pretty much is Vikings and Romans and Dick Turpin and a few more things. But anything beyond that is. Um, it's quite odd because it's it's either taboo or you get the feeling that the, the, they're either ignorant about it or they actually want to suppress it. So some of the things we've been doing are there's a couple of people who've set up um, um, a, it's called a York Past and Present Facebook site, which I, I find it quite interesting because you've actually got people con contributing their own photographs or, fo or photos of objects that themselves have got within their own families that um, that you don't usually have access to. So there's a lot of that coming out. There's um, a big brutalist 1960s building, which is probably the only one, probably the only contemporary building in the centre of York, which is some controversy about at the moment, whether it stays or goes. Um, so we've been doing some work around that. Um, there's two there's two public uh, sorry there's two music venues within this building. Um, so we've been been gathering stories about, about that, some of the performance there over the years. And there's, uh, there's a, a cafe that, um, um, a, a lot, most of the cafes in the centre of York are quite expensive and they're either she, she or Starbucks. This is like a real working class cafe, it's one of the very few ones in there. So you get some really good um, discussions with people there. Um, so there's been quite a lot of work around that. And, um, and well, one of the things that I, I've been doing is, is this, it's these walks, and we've put up our own plaques. And um, I tried to... Ex it's cardboard, yeah. I mean, it can just disintegrate in the rain. Or it can, 
<laughs> okay, but they look like real blue plaques. That that one, I think that's a. Oh, is it? Oh, well, <laughs> well, what I mean by stories that uh, are neglected by the mainstream, this is on the site of a, a, a disused gents where in 1954 two 16-year-old kids from York called Stuart Feather and John Chessman met and started a relationship together uh, when being gay was completely illegal. And they eventually moved to London and in 1972 they organised the first gay pride marches in London. Um, Stuart Feather, he's still alive, John Chesterman isn't, but he was the son, his parents ran a fish and chip shop in York, you know, you're talking about really sort of ordinary working class people doing something extraordinary really. Um, so, so we've got things like that and we, do, um, we, we include suffragette cafes on, on these walks. Um, the uh, the Peterloo massacre took place obviously in Manchester, but the actual trial took place in York in the same building, same Crown Court, which is still in use. And um, which was where the Yorkshire Luddites were um, condemned to death in 1812. And we had, uh, um, in, in 2012, we had um, a commemoration of that, um, a little walk through the centre of town. It was um, in, in January, so there's snow on the ground, and we put um, um, uh, sticks in the ground, really, with little tombstones with the names of each of these uh, young, very young men, which is what they were, and uh, who were judicially murdered. And um, that's pretty much it. But we, we're, there's something else in the wings. We're not quite sure what's going to happen next, but it will. Yeah, so we've been trying through all of the walks and the DIY plaque events and hanging out in cafes and doing stalls outside buildings um, to create a range. I'm doing live inquiry drop-ins at the library as well and just trying to create lots of different spaces for discussion and for bringing people together who wouldn't usually talk to each other. And I guess one of the things that's come up a lot in York, hasn't it, is about, on one hand, and this isn't unusual and, and maybe seems obvious, but is is worth saying is that on one hand there's a really strong perception that they anonymous they make decisions somewhere else a long way away from you and that really won't be interested in anything you have to say on the other hand when you talk to the people who are in these decision making positions often feel quite isolated quite defensive quite cut off and so one of the things we've been trying to do is just create just small chip small pathways that might move but might connect up conversations and one really big thing that's come out of that recently isn't it is around the um, John Oxley, the city archaeologist, came to one of our live inquiry drop-ins completely. I wasn't expecting him, and he was talking to Richard Liam from the Facebook group that Paul's mentioned. And fantastic thing that's come out of that is public and citizen sort of documentation of buildings that are going through the planning process. And we started to pilot that a couple of weeks ago. So, so yeah, so trying to create spaces where those discussions can happen. Um, can I just add to that? Yeah. I think what one of the um one of the key themes that's run through this is the it, we, and this is a little bit uh, corny, but um, the idea of a, a lowercase i it, as an individual within institutions, you know, capital I. So, looking at just instead of that polarised argument, so often that many of us as activists, as grassroots activists, have, have spent decades in battles that end in probably most people kind of, you know, uh, losing. So it's looking at, it, seeing it more as a continuum and the idea that it, there are individuals within institutions, of course, as well as outside, without institutions that can make connections and, and, we're, and, and often that isolation can maybe be circumvented by the idea of a coalition of the willing is one of the phrases that came up. So just identifying different people with di from different backgrounds, different positions who are just passionate about something, share a passion, looking to create empathy in terms of the limitations perhaps that some people have to work within and at the same time recognising that there, you know, there isn't this kind of polarised us and them. So hum humanising decision making was, the, was, was a key phrase that's been running through all of this, the idea that it's just it's too easy to say this is, this is, this is not the responsibility um, of an individual or group of individuals, and how you how you make that more um, more scalable. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think um, yeah, that's that's been really crucial, hasn't it? And it's come out of at so many people in the co in the kind of the co-design team that work together in phase one are in institutional positions where they want to make changes and don't always feel like they've they've got the they don't know how necessarily, and it's not always easy to know how. I think, and that's. 
about, and I think seeing, have, using the multiple perspectives in the team and then broadening that out within the inquiry strands as well has allowed some of that, that, you know, the use of that diversity has enabled some of these conceptualizations to come forward, I think. So, um, so yeah, just in terms of our sticking points of everyone, in a way, the coalition, the willing that you speak about, Danny, and the kind of networks between individuals outside and inside institutions, it's explicitly not everyone. It's kind of anyone. It's anyone who might be interested to get involved. It's trying to create uh, different kinds of constituencies around particular decisions, such as Stonebow House, the Brutalist Building, Paul talks about we've been trying to create um, a constituency of users and people who are interested around it, almost to start to dynamically model a different way of thinking about consultation from the council's perspective. And similarly with the Science Museum Synthesizer Collection, there is a there is a constituency around that who have a lot of opinions about how the Science Museum are developing their electronic music collection. So it's making those kind of constituencies that aren't everyone, but are kind of anyone who's interested. And that's a more manageable political constituency for decision making. So that's one thing we've been looking at. And then the other big emerging idea, I suppose, is around the future. And um, more sort of like sense that the future comes from present use rather than the future being something that is managed by an institution somehow coldly and dispassionately but sort of seeing the, fu the, the future coming from passion now and in a sense that be sustainable through dynamism and use including potentially use of synthesizers in the science museum collection which is something we're we're sort of been talking about recently um, and I think certainly in York, we, the future coming from now in terms of collective decision making rather than it somehow being made on our behalf in some way, which... Um, so, yes, I hope that's a little flavour of what we've been up to. And we'd love to talk to you about it more. And we've got the stall downstairs. We'll be saying more about that in a minute. But what we'd like to do now is just give you a chance just to reflect on what we've said in the light of your work and the kind of things you're interested in. And we thought we could do this sort of reflecting the way we've worked, really, by in pairs sort of int you know, introducing maybe a, a, a kind of decision or a kind of political dimension of your work that you'd like to explore. But then together sort of thinking, well, what might be the resources, possibilities for, I don't know, unsticking some of the things that might be in the way? Um, so if you'd like to do that in pairs, that would be fantastic. And what we'll do at the end is ask you to commemorate something coming from the conversations on our plaques and we'll add it to our stall downstairs that we're hoping these plaques are going to spread around the whole, the whole of, the, of the buildings downstairs. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, so, so if just echoing what, what Helen's sort of saying there, what, what we're, we are, we're really interested in a, lo in a longer term conversation with you. So there's contact details, this is the cell, there's contact details on the back of the, the brochure. There's a, there's a good blog site and, you know, we'd, we, we will be um, certainly having a bigger, a bigger public um, get together and we'd, we'd certainly love to have some, some further communication with you. It's going to be limited today, of course. But what we're trying to do is this, this idea of um, blocks or, or issues that you're dealing with and then just trying to identify with somebody else how you might see that differently. What might be a different way of approaching um, a solution? To that so that's it's kind of a micro crowdsource you know sort of uh, an analysis and solution so the, just as an example for me it, big big issue is about permissions so the idea that you know I, I mean I individually declare the pottery Stoke-on-Trent a world heritage site you know I don't need UNESCO to do it you know and it's just another equivalent of of, of, the, of the blue plaques and you know the unofficial um, activism that, that goes on left, right, and centre. So it's just think about from your point of view. That's what we're looking for you to do today. Is just in pairs identify something you know l around that issue and look at look at sort of different ways you might tackle that that aren't necessarily the, the uh, you know head-on confrontational deep in the in the furrow. <laughs> the value of the, of the 14 of us working together to design the research project is exactly that, isn't it? It's sort of, us all bringing the things we've always normally think about into a space where we're able to be challenged and sort of, you know, new ideas about how to approach that, introduce and we've used that to sort of generate our research, really. So that's I'm why... I'm sure we're absolutely preaching to the converted <laughs> in many ways, of course. But it is, you know, many of, many of you will, will also you know, know about things like small change, of course, and all of those. So it's about individual actions that can make a difference. And that's, that's an, another thing that we're looking to, to do. Things that you do have relative control over as an individual, whichever your perspective is. Okay, great, so I think we've probably got about 10 minutes for that. So 
Um, so, yeah, talk to the person next to you, share something you, you, you've been thinking about in relation to the politics of heritage, and then see if you can help each other think around it in some way. And then we'll be passing out our plaques for its, its commemoration at the end. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Sounds like there's some great conversations going on there. We've got about five minutes left, so I thought just to finish off, it'd be good just to hear from a couple of people about their conversations, maybe, and then we'll ask you to commemorate it on the plaque. So does anyone want to just share what they were talking about? Probably haven't got time for everyone, but if a couple of people wanted to come forward, that would be great. Yeah? <laughs> Pass the baton to you, Paul. I have to be careful here if this is going live. <laughs> um, there's been a, a recently on the island. There has been a controversy, and um, there has been discussion based around a local hotel owner who bought uh, over a hotel which had been on the market for a long time without a buyer and had bought over the hotel. And from the feedback that he'd had from his customers, decided that. Um, because of sound leakage and because of heating costs and things, then he had to replace the sash and case timber windows on this B-listed building um, with UPV, UPVC windows, double glazing, new double glazing. So he applied for planning permission and was refused planning permission and took the windows out and put in UPVC double glazing windows anyway. Now, the interesting thing is that from a community point of view, um, a large proportion of the community were entirely behind him and said, quite right, this is your business, this is good for supporting the local area, and you should be allowed to do that, to the point where I think it was 1,100 people signed a petition, broadly in favour, not specifically, the wording wasn't specifically, we support this individual for doing it, but it was broadly in favour. Uh, the wider context of that is that the hotel sits on the corner of a square, which is currently receiving a uh, Townscape Heritage Initiative funding from Heritage Lottery Fund. So it's it's in a place which is all about using heritage as an economic driver to, to build up heritage and to attract people to the island. And as a hotelier, then an argument has been made that it would be in the hotelier's interest to participate in that community and participate in that heritage community. But his decision and the decision of a lot of people in, in, in the wider local community, the general community, is actually that UBVC window is the right way to go because it helps protect his business. Uh, that's the problem and it hasn't yet reached a solution, but it does pose, in, in light of what you're talking about here, it does pose some very interesting questions, I think, in terms of who's got precedence in terms of making those decisions. Is the fact that it's listed more important than the desires of the local community? Um, should should that listing be something that potentially would drive that hotel out of existence, perhaps because of the expensive heating or because people wouldn't come to the hotel because of the, the noise that comes off the street and stuff? There's a whole, it's thrown up a whole load of issues in that sort of way. And aside from any of the local politics of it, I think it's very interesting looking at those sort of examples and understanding where you get these really fundamental clashes between what maybe the professional side kind of perceives as being the right thing to do, i.e. be listed, must be protected, must be preserved in that sort of way, and what local community views are on that thing. Um, and I think it's it's currently ongoing and it'll be very interesting to see how it resolves itself. And I'll probably be taking back some of the stuff from what I'm learning here into that argument to kind of say, well, you know, here's some alternative ways, some wider ways of looking at it. So, and if there's, if there's a solution, it'd be interesting. Did the Townscape Heritage Organisation get involved? Like, and talk about possible grants for wooden double glazing or that? I understand there was that potential, yeah. But the problem is, is that I think the Townscape Heritage Initiative thing would have, would, it would have been a grant for the whole building rather than just specifically the window replacement. So it would have been additional cost for that individual, although there would have been more done to the building in that sort of way. So as far as I understand it. So there was that kind of, there is that kind of tension as well in terms of how, how that worked out and stuff. So. Well, can I just, can I say, I've gone just time, I'm sorry. sorry. Well, I think, no, it, it, it's perfect. And what, what we saw straight away, you open up a dialogue and people have different ideas and chuck it in. I know it's obvious stuff to, to many of us, but so often it's entrenched positions where the, that dialogue doesn't happen. An interesting example with Timescape Heritage Initiative, where it's managed as a, as a new space for dialogue and discussion about, uh, about some of these things, and that's where it works really well. Sometimes it's entrenched. It's a community, the new initiative in their own, but it seems like the owner went straight to planning got the refusal based on policy and then there's sort of the conversation and then it comes to a negative result. It becomes a very difficult yeah. so that, that space isn't here to have those conversations, I don't think. I think yeah. this is one of the things that maybe comes out of it. But 
sorry, comes out of it. Like that, that space isn't necessarily created to have that conversation between different interested parties. So, so as you said, it becomes very entrenched very quickly, and then it becomes difficult to have that yeah. dialogue because of the entrenchment in that sort of way. So it's. Thank you so much. It's really good, though. You just immediately you you the, the conversation evolves and starts to spin off. Can I ask? for somebody who's got maybe a, a, an intangible so-called heritage example. This is a last one, last one, but just something that's intan less tangible than a building. Is, has somebody, somebody got some, a, an example which is slightly less? Just very quickly, because we'll probably get kicked out. I didn't want to volunteer myself because I don't know how to tell it quickly. Um, it's a bit of commemoration. It's, it's so messy is actually what we were talking about. Uh, it's something that comes out of my doctoral research, but it's a historic example, and I've actually lost touch with it a bit, so I'm not sure what's happened now. It has to do with um, a commemoration um, of the deportation of Jews from Paris, uh, which happened in 1942. And the commemoration actually started in the war by people affected, so by, affected, by people who had lost a family member, usually, in this uh, deportation. It starts in 1944 and it continues more or less just run by this community of affected people until 1992. And in that year there's a kind of political brouhaha about it. And the next year it's taken over by the state. And we're just talking about the, the messiness of that process, which most people involved acknowledged as a really good thing because they were so pleased to see their history somehow made official in this process. Yet at the same time as the state moved in and took control of this commemoration, suddenly it really changed. So I was just saying two of the, the things, well, they brought in a kind of military band to do the music. They brought in barriers to channel people. And, and there was a wonderful quote from the newspaper for a woman saying, have they not realized what barriers mean to people in this situation? So there was not really much dialogue. This is happening in 1993. And yet, you know, if you ask people at the time, they would say this is a good thing, but it's clearly a messy thing, and that's, like, that's as far as we got. Wonderful, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I think that when we're talking about the sticking point, I think one of, the, one of the reasons why it's sticky is because sometimes what seems to be recognition, something that people want, things to be recognised as being valuable, also takes power away from the people who think it's important. I think that has been really at the crux of what we've been trying to work through. So I just wanted to thank you all so much for coming and joining us and sharing all of the issues that you're working on. And um, if you would like to commemorate something to put on our stand downstairs, then please do so. And if you'd like to keep in touch, that would be fantastic. And we'd love to keep in touch with you. So if you just switch over the, the side of the plaque to the blank side and write your name and address, then we will add you to our mailing list and, and kind of keep in touch with you as, as we go forward. Things that we, that we, uh, we know are coming up, that um, just to give you a heads up about is that um, we will be um, you know, sharing um, our thinking on the blog over the coming months as it kind of coalesces and forms and um, we will be having a, a kind of open event in October or no November and it'd be fantastic to see some of you there maybe. So just a final thanks I guess for coming and I'm hoping to see you again so I hope this isn't goodbye. We're going to be down at the stall for the rest of the day and tomorrow. D15 is almost yeah downstairs so come and come and have a chat really because i think some of the conversations we've started here would be fantastic to explore further in a conversational way so thank you very much thanks for coming thank